All right, so I'm excited to continue. We're gonna go, um, I had some food, I feel much more refreshed now. We're now gonna look at um, profile, then we're gonna do the four transformations and then we're gonna do, um, we're gonna end on the not self. Okay, so first I'm gonna share, um, so this is your chart again. So you're a three five, and I'm sure you've you've read about three five, and I'm sure you know things about, about the three five. I just kind of want to go over it again from the perspective of bonding strategy, and also from the perspective of having that ten four, because you have that fourth fourth line in uh, gate ten. So you're also gonna. It's almost like your profile is a three five four. If that makes sense, you know, you're like a three five, also having to do some of the obligations before. We're a three four five. We you know we could joke. Um, okay, so first let's just look at the three five. General advice for the three five: have relationships that are flexible, have good communication when things are changing in those relationships, and allow coming and going and renegotiating. You know, I like to joke with third lines, they, they, they get a thousand first dates because you really do get to break and recreate that bond again and again and again. If you do that awake, then you're going to do that with communication, with compassion, with intelligence. If you do that asleep, you're just going to break up with the person and then get back together with them and then break up with them and then get back together with them or with the friend group or, you know, however it is. So it, you really want to um, just be aware of the need to break and recreate the bond. I know some three fives who have long distance relationships really enjoy that, where they enjoy relationships where they get to see the person once a week and so on. You have a concentrated on the splenic binary here, as we've been talking about, this first tone is concentrated. And so that actually means that you can be joined at the hip with somebody, like you can stand to be in really close proximity to them for long periods of time. Uh, you know, so that's kind of funny with that bonds made and broken, just realize, you know, you might be spending a lot of time with that person, you still are going to need to recreate, I mean, even just sleeping in your own room is a way of breaking the bond every night you break the bond, you say good night, you go into your room, and you have your own room and your own bed. And that's a way of breaking the bond. It's very important that you have that ability to break and recreate and renegotiate the bond. You don't want to get stuck in the bond. It's like, um, Say you have a friend and they want to start playing music together. And then pretty soon they say, hey, we're going to go on a tour together. I'm so excited. And you're like, I didn't agree to that. But you have this undefined solar plexus. So you're too nervous to tell them you don't want to go on tour with them. And also, it's not a correct relationship for you because they are not allowing you to break that bond and to renegotiate it under new terms. You know, it's the ability to say, hey, I want to be a full-time employee and then to renegotiate and go, look, things have changed. I need to only work two days a week now, you know, and to be able to renegotiate your contract, so to speak. That's what the third line needs. It needs the continual renegotiation of the contract as needed when it comes up naturally, when the bond naturally reaches a dead end and it needs to be broken. So the new bond can be formed. Now, the fifth line, the advice I give to the three fives with the fifth line on the unconscious is simply give people as much practical advice as possible. It's as, it's as simple as that. And give people as much practical help as possible. And, you know, um, don't use the excuse that you never agreed to it. Because everyone who's a conscious fifth line knows that the way the world works is a conscious fifth line. It doesn't matter what somebody tells you. It really matters what's actually going on. So I know a lot of three fives who are in relationships that they call them one thing, but it's practically speaking something else. And they're basically deluding themselves. As a fifth line, call it what it is. Call it what it practically is. If you're dating somebody, you know, and intimate with them, then they're your partner. And you can call it that instead of, I know a lot of third lines will pretend that that is not you know, these, this three, five thing, the, 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 like I've heard three, five say, this person had all these expectations of me and I never agreed to any of that. And so it's their fault when the relationship went sour that they were really mad at me. And I just say, look, well, first of all, it's nobody's fault when those things happen, but you know, being a three, five, you can't just use a get out of jail free card of being a right angle all the time. It works some of the time, but people eventually chase you out of town with pitchforks. And, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, what I'm saying is, Three fives can get a really bad rap 
when they're not paying attention to the fifth line necessity to deliver practical solutions to others' problems. If you're not solving their problems, you are the problem. You know, that's a, what a fifth line knows. I'm a fifth line. If I'm not solving your problems right now in this video, in some way, even if you're mad at me, even if you're annoyed with me, even if you think I'm cheesy and roll your eyes, even if this or this or this, you know, if I'm not solving your problems, I'm just wasting your time. Right. So I have to solve your problems. That's why at each step, I'm like, what can I give you that's practical? This is the fifth line way. As long as you do that, you're, you know, people are going to love you. You're going to get out of jail free every time. But, you know, because the, the third line needs a lot of get out of jail free cards in the sense that it's here to make mistakes. It's here to, to, you know, not necessarily, I mean, it's here to learn the price of everything. And, you know, it's here to pay the price of everything, but it breaks. And third lines break a lot. You have third line nodes. I have third line nodes too. You have third and second. I just have third on both sides. But third line nodes, people come and go from our lives a lot. And we just have to accept that. That's a signpost we're living correctly. I mean, with your second line, you're going to let in very few people. And then with your third line nodes here, you're going to have a variety of people coming and going and making and breaking bonds in your life. <coughs> And even though I'm a fifth line, I'm a five one, of course, I have third line nodes on both sides. And I'll tell you, I've had people come and go through my life and I've had to renegotiate and recreate my friendship with people again and again and again in different ways, in different forms. Okay, so being a three five, the bonding strategy, the last thing I'm gonna leave you with was just uh, the bonds being broken and the seducer are seduced. Just that's the important, you know, I think it's mainly note there, yeah. Oh, plus don't forget about the fourth line. Okay, great. Well, so the seducer seduced is simply saying that in any situation you're going to be, because I already pretty much talked about bonds made and broken. Bonds made and broken is you're going to need to have people in your life that will allow you to come and go and to renegotiate your boundary with them. Seducer seduced is you're going to have people in your life who are either going to be able to seduce you or you're going to be able to seduce them. Now, there's nothing you can really do about this other than there's always going to be this drive to seduce the hard to get, the unobtainable. That's what it's really about. Uh, you think of like um, some guy usually, you know, and then he's married to someone and they go, how did he get some, you know, woman like that? This example, Ra always uses. Of course, it can work with any genders. It doesn't have to be, and it can work with no gender for people who are non-gender binary. It's not about gender. It's just about um when people go, wow, how did that person get someone so out of their league, quote unquote, it's because they're a fifth line. The fifth line gets people out of, out of our league, so to speak. Um, the, the fifth line personality, like me, does it through my personality, through my seductive personality, which is to say my mind. My mind and my personality are continually kind of seducing people into my worldview. What, what is that doing? That's saying, hey, come over here. Try seeing it this way. You'll, you might like it better. Now, it's very different for you at the fifth line body. That's a seductive body. It doesn't even know it's being seductive sometimes. It has no idea it's being seductive. But the way they move the body, you'll notice I have a first line body. My first line body is not seductive. My first line body, you know, my body movements are not seductive body movements. Now, I'm not going to pretend to do seductive. I mean, I don't know. I guess like seductive body movements. My imagination of them is kind of lithe movements, um, you know, dancing in a, in a seductive way and so on. Um, I, you know, this is, I, I don't really know. I mean, I think it actually goes much deeper than that, but I think it's oftentimes, I mean, it's unconscious. It's the design. It's not even necessarily that you're, I mean, we, we say that the design side is the body, but it's both the body and the personality of the unconscious in some sense, this other personality that's inside of us. Okay, so, and then don't, don't forget about the fourth line. Okay, so... The fourth line is going to also need this confidant confiding in thing where people have to be your friend. They have to confide in you uh, because you have this fourth line role of the opportunist because of your 10 four, it's going to be so important for you to have, um, you know, people that really trust you and that confide in you and treat you as a friend. And so just ask yourself, like if you're in a relationship, is this person really my friend? If you're in a business with somebody, is this person really my friend? Any person that you're working with on a deep level, but particularly relationships, you're in a romantic relationship, it, you know, you're dating someone, is this person treating me as a friend? And an example would be if they use normal words with you versus really fancy, weird words. So like, 
I know a guy, um, yeah, who was actually dating a fourth line and he was saying that he was using very convoluted words. And she asked me, is that something a friend would say? And I say, well, he never uses those words when he's talking to me. So I would say, no, you know, a friend will say, Hey, like say that they're taking a break on the relationship. Hey, um, I need some time. Things are going a little rough. I just need to like figure out my stuff to myself or whatever, you know, that's how a friend talks. Instead, he was like, I am doing some soul searching and finding that the compassionate answer for the, I, I can't even do it, but making up a lot of like descriptions and explanations and flowery speech. It's not, that's not how a friend treats you. So this is just a really good practical piece of advice. I'll type this in here. Practical advice. Ask yourself, is this person treating me like a friend? Casual, laid back, relaxed, no big deal. That's how friends treat each other. You know, that's the best thing for you. It's just this kind of de-escalation back to friendship. Okay, now we're going to get started on the four transformations. I'm very excited about this. Uh, the four transformations are really powerful. They really are, are life-changing. Um, and, you know, you don't have to do them right away. Do them when you're ready. The first two um, are going to be the ones that are really going to change your life. And then the second two are kind of the ones that help you become more acute um, for other people and kind of what you give other people. And it's more about the development of your personality so that your personality is not in as much transference. And we'll talk about what, what transference is when we get there. Okay, so starting with your determination. It is indirect touch. And it's funny because it, it, for you, it says don't drink too much water or I've, I've written this, these are my notes, but, but it, I'm actually really thirsty. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting. Why would you not drink too much water? I mean, when you're, it's because the transference, the third color needs a lot of water and has to do with memory. When you drink too much water, you're going to get overwhelmed by memories. It's not, it's not great for you to have all of that water, all of those memories flooding you all of maybe even sentimentality or nostalgia. Experiment with intermittent fasting. No solid meals from dawn to dusk. Try eating the biggest meal before going to bed and sleeping on your food. Yeah, I mean, these are just kind of basic ideas for being indirect. You're indirect light. So it's like, eat at night. I mean, you've probably heard this stuff before. For conditions eaters like you, it's all about when you eat. So pay extra special attention to the timing and notice that you probably get hungriest around midnight. Touch cognition means eating with your hands and touching food can be really helpful. Oh yeah, in some sense. Um, also be careful eating at restaurants and such. To only eat at places with a good vibe because you take in more from the food subtly than other people on account of having sixth tone cognition. You know, eat food you feel emotionally clear about and have good emotional feelings about. Sixth tone is part of the solar plexus binary. Food you're not nervous about eating. Make sure to dim the lights or preferably eat outside in the dark or moonlight if you can. And part of the solar plexus binary, touch is a psychic superpower we don't know much about. Experiment with your sixth tone cognition. It might just be a mutant superpower. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about moonlight because I mean, moonlight still... But no, it's indirect. It's reflected. I guess, yeah, it's reflected. So it's fine. It's fine. It's just you don't want to be in direct light. You want to be in reflected light or bounced light. You don't want to have the direct sunlight hitting you. So yeah, it's something to experiment with. I mean, this is something when you're ready, you'll just notice that you start doing it and you'll start waking up later and later. And pretty soon you'll be waking up at 2 p.m., and you know, staying up later and so on. And you'll be eating your big meal at midnight and I mean, it's just these things kind of naturally organically happen. And, you know, I, I had someone tell me, oh, it sucks having indirect. I hate having indirect because I'm so weird. I'm reverse of everybody. I'm so tired all day and I'm awake at night. And I said, what are you talking about? It's great. You can wake up at 2 p.m. You can be having your breakfast when people are getting off work, your brunch, and then go and hang out with them at their peak hours. People's peak hours are like 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And that's so awesome to have your peak hours. You know what I mean? But she's like, no, I have to work during the normal job. Well, that's the thing. I mean, first of all, you're a projector. You're not here to work. But second, being indirect, it's not going to really be correct for you to do a lot of stuff during the day. You know, you're, you're really made for the nighttime. 
Okay, now we go on to the environments or the environment, you know, rather, uh, uh, kitchens and it's taste with tone two. And so taste with tone two, uh, sorry, taste is tone two is as a, you know, as a environment is interesting to think of. Like, what is it to taste in your environment? Well, for one thing, airflow. In fact, I'm taste uh, cognition. I was just kind of wanting to get some fresh air here. Open fresh air myself. Yeah, get a nice breeze in here. Airflow is so very important for taste people because you're tasting the air. Now, at the same time, you don't want it to be overly exposed. You don't want huge picture windows. You don't want everyone to be able to see you. I mean, there has to be certain walls. Um, tone two is, you know, it's closed off. It's not meant to let everything in. And it's meant to be secure in some sense. It has, um, you know, its focus is on uncertainty, if, if you will, which is the preparation for anything that could happen. And so it's very much about an environment that, you know, can be prepared for anything. Now, um, because it's kitchens, it's wet kitchens, these are melting pots of mutation. Second tone environments, um, let's see, no picture windows and so on. And then uh, oops. third line nodes. Yeah, so we can look at the third line nodes here. And that's another part of it. Um, bonds made and broken again. And it's left variable. So you need action, movement, and co working spaces. So this, so I'm talking, so I see I just kind of integrated in the line and then the variable here. Um, yeah, tone two, very specific places, very special to you, very narrowly, like not just every kitchen will be correct. Like it's going to be like not like nine out of 10 kitchens are going to be incorrect for you. Second tone means very precise, very specific locations. I'll, I'll add that too. Uh, second tone is very specific. Like your special kitchen, not just any kitchen. Right. And then we look at the third color. This is the kitchen. This is the mutative place for people from all different walks of life. I mean, you really are at your best in cities. You're at your best in hardscape. You're at your best, um, you know, hardscape, lots of auras. Um, yeah, you're at your best in cities. You're really at your best, like in places where there's a lot of things changing from one thing to another, like workshops, studios. Um, Art, art buildings, you know, workshops, studios, artist spaces. And then um, as we move, so as you see, it's two, three, three would be the TCL. Two tone, three color, three line. And that TCL two, three, three. Yeah, very mutative. It's like you're in a bonds made and broken mutative third line environment already with that 55, 59 nodal environment on the design side. Um, full of spirit and uh, friction and all sorts of, yeah, exciting. It's an exciting environment. And then, um, yeah, and then so what, what we're really looking at here is it, it's left variable. It needs, it's like your, your brain system is really the only right variable. Your brain system, your indirect light, that's the passive brain system that's nurtured by being really chill during the day, not having a lot of pressure during the day and stuff like that, and really coming to life at night and really nurtured. I mean, this is a sixth tone, sixth color digestive system uh, touch. You know, it's very, it's like if there is a possibility of mutant superpowers, here's where it is. Here's your really, but also very delicate, not meant to work very hard, not meant to, you know, you, you don't work this brain system by forcing it to do a whole bunch of hard labor. You kind of let it chill out. Meanwhile, you're designed everything else to be left. So you can be in a really busy environment. You can be in a really busy workspace, a really busy business where nobody even notices you come or go. That's kind of what's meant by observer observed, right? Variable environments are observer environments where everyone notices everyone who walks in. But observed environments are where nobody notices anything. You just go in an environment and it's like you're actually not being observed, really. I mean, you are, but 
you're being observed by the right variable people on the right variable part of the environment, but you're actually in the middle of the hustle and bustle. Say there's a whole bunch of desks, everyone's busy working, that's the left variable environment. Everyone's sitting around another area, that's the right variable environment, just looking around because they're noticing, oh, they, you notice that's where people are. It's like people watching, it's the ultimate right variable environment. You're not here for people watching. You're not here for that. You're here to actually be in busy environments. So, you know, you're here to be where people are working, where they are active, where they are doing things, where they are preoccupied, where they're running around, where they're busy, not where nothing's going on. Boring environments where nothing's going on, couch potato environments and stuff like that are a slow death for you. Like just people sitting around watching TV, that's not, that's not your environment. So now we move over to the personality side. The personality side is really what you're here for for other people, right? Because on the design side, you're nurturing yourself by having a nocturnal lifestyle, eating late at night, you know, just eating, not in direct light, stuff like that, getting in touch with your touch cognition. Um, you know, on the design side, you're already nourishing yourself if, if you're doing those things. And then if you're in kitchens and if you're in the right environment and you're in a healthy environment for you and you're really sensitized to that environment, you're already really nourishing yourself. So the personality is not about nourishing yourself, really. This is about what you can give to other people. Excuse me, this um to make this a little tighter. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out later. So oh, here we go. So yeah, there we go. That's better. Yeah, so um I'll go back. So the personality side, this is what people come to you for. This is when they come to you, they want you know something from you they want your outer authority they want what you see that other people don't see they want what what you can give them that other people can't give them well that's only going to work when it's not in transference and certain people are going to pull you into transference others aren't right but if they do pull you into transference you're not going to be able to give them anything helpful or useful and i'll, I'll talk about what that transference is now the view is kind of the foundation of the motivation in the sense that this is what you're here to see first and so you're really here to see power with a first tone security focus keeping track of power who's winning who's losing who is taking advantage keeping score who paid for lunch last time fueled by the vigilance of an always on left variable scanning for threat or potential security holes do you notice you know who's winning and lose who's losing the transference is personal like innocence which is funny because you are innocent so we're going to have to kind of show how this is interesting here right and we'll, we'll get to that but the transference is personal which is not keeping track of winners and losers not keeping score not comparing so you're really here to see in comparison. You're here to see things in comparison to other things. You're here to see, okay, uh, let's keep track of this. You know, who is really in charge here? Who's really winning here? Who really has the power here? If you go to a business, you can see the power dynamics, notice the power dynamics. You're not here to notice how each individual person in that business has their own individual unique role to play. You're here to see how certain people are forcing others to be in certain roles and keeping the certain roles for themselves and yada, yada, yada. You're really here to see power. Okay, now I'm gonna actually move on to, um, see if I can actually, there we go. So uh, I'm gonna share this other image really quick. Okay, so now I'm gonna go on to motivation. So your motivation is, is innocence, this is correct for you. Now it transfers to desire, right? And so what that means is that you're here, <coughs> excuse me, you are here to <coughs> ultimately be like what you give people, what they will pay you for, what they will beg you for, what your differentiated, unique way of being to them is through your innocence, through your refusal to take sides. In fact, because you're left variable, you're, um, vigilant refusal to take sides, persistent refusal to take sides, you know, staying out of it, 
staying in the realm of observing, observing and noticing what's going on um, instead of taking sides. So I'm an agenda person. I'm the exact opposite of you. I am a desire person. And so I'm all about taking sides and I'm all about saying this is right and that's wrong and do it this way and not that way and so on. But as a sixth line, I mean, sorry, a sixth color here, it's very much like the sixth line, I guess you could say. The sixth color is is outside of it all. It's the fool on the hill. It's the it's on the roof. You know, it's here to really be outside of motivation itself, to not really have goals, not really have motivations in the way that we typically think of them. And this is what you can really give people. And when they say, what have you noticed? What have you observed? You know, that's when you can give them your observations, your true observations. And that's that's really the best. Now, I, I want to um, go into the not self because the not self is really what it's about for me. So for this not self analysis, because, you know, your four transformations, this kind of takes care of itself. This takes care of itself as long as everything's functioning properly. You can experiment with it. You can see what it's like consciously trying to kind of, you know, stay up a little later or eat closer to midnight or something like that, you know, as an experiment. But really, it pretty much takes care of itself. And you can use it as a signpost. I will say it's a great signpost. Notice who pulls you into desire. Those people are not really good people for you. Don't hang out with those people, the people that really pull you into, well, you need a five-year plan. And, you know, what's, what's your goals anyway? You don't seem to have any motivation to do anything. And what is it? Screw those people. You don't need those people. Just let, let them go. Let them go. Undefined spleen. Let them go. You know, but that's what I'm trying to say is, so now I want to talk about the not self because the not self, it's, you know, it's what's going to mess everything up. It's what's going to be the dilemmas. That undefined spleen is going to make you hold on to somebody, even though they pull you into desire. Now, if, if the not self isn't interfering, if you're living correctly, if you're deconditioning and you're just living correctly and the not self is not interfering, then great. Then everything else just takes care of itself. You're just waiting for the invitations. The right people are recognizing and inviting you. You're not you're not volunteering. I always say people in the not self are constantly volunteering, you know? Like you're no longer volunteering. You're waiting to be invited. And when that happens, and when the not self isn't constantly interfering with you, everything kind of just takes care of itself. Like, yeah, it can still be really useful information to know your motivation. It can be really useful to know that you're an indirect light eater with touch. It can be really good to know that you're made for wet kitchens with taste. These are great things to know. And you can use them as signposts and markers and you can experiment with them. Like, you know, people say that you're only supposed to use your strategy and authority to find everything. Well, sure, but you can still also go, hey, I know that I'm kitchen, so why don't I put my desk in the kitchen and see if I like it? Then after a week, you can notice if you like it or not. How do you notice? You follow your strategy and authority. You notice that your 2010 is saying, wow, I really love having the kitchen and, you know, having my desk in the kitchen now. That's okay, right? You can love having your desk in the kitchen and you could have thought about, hey, what happens if I put my desk in the kitchen? You know, so people get so weird in human design, like, well, you used your mind to think like I should go to the kitchen and then you happened to enjoy the kitchen. Therefore, you weren't living your design. No, that's complete crap. You're living your design if you're deconditioning, if you're noticing the not self. So that's why I want to finish now on the not self. The not self is really the most important thing. I know I spent you know, an hour talking about every other, every other part of the chart, but the not self is really the most important thing. Okay, so the not self is going to threaten bitterness. It's going to tell you that you will be bitter at every step of the way. It's going to say, you will be bitter if, right? This is its favorite thing to, to do. So I am going to show you now this is the ego as kind of the core of the not self. Um, I guess I can. Right. OK, well, you got it. And this ego has 44 and 25 pointing at it. These are two areas where your not self um, deconditioning will be learning to accept and love yourself. And that you don't need to have 51, you don't need to have 26, because here there's the feeling of I am missing something. I'm bitter because I'm broken. And I'm broken because I don't have the courage and I don't have the nerve. And it's just not true. 
You don't need those. You have the 44. You have the recognition of who has the nerve. You have the 25. You have the uh, continually being shocked by those who have the guts and the courage. You know, so that's the first thing. Deconditioning here is self-love, saying I accept myself even though I don't, I don't have to prove that I have any guts to jump into anything. I don't have to prove that I have the nerve to get up in front of everybody and do the public speaking thing and sell myself and any of that. I don't have to prove it. I got nothing to prove about any of that. It can be thrilling to you. It can be exciting to you. I mean, you can gain all of the tips and tricks for public speaking with that 26 and having the nerve and all the tips and tricks for getting the courage up and whatever else, but it's ultimately not you. It doesn't have to be you. And then there's the feeling with the 4521 being completely open and the 4037 being completely open. These are the feelings that nobody else will have the resources for you, that 45. So you have to have the discipline and stamina to have the discipline to have the resources for yourself and the control and so on, to be in control, the self-control. And then that 4037 is saying, nobody else will have the affection for you and nobody else is willing to work for you. So you better just work really hard for yourself. So this is just independence. All this says, I'm gonna be independent. I'm gonna work for myself. I'm not gonna depend on anybody. Nobody else has any resources for me. Nobody else has any affection for me. Nobody else has any of this stuff for me. Hey, look, you don't have to do that. You can be interdependent. There are people out there who will give you affection, who will give you resources, who will give you money. In fact, that's what's amazing is as you decondition through human design, your relationship to money, your relationship to all this ego stuff changes. You know, it changes big time. And suddenly it's, it's not the same anymore. You're not worried about money anymore in the same way that, you know, you think of money as breath where you breathe out, you spend money, you breathe in and money comes in and having this undefined ego, you can actually make a lot of money from that through the wisdom of the ego, through the wisdom of, you know, um, what has value really, but that's only there when it's not making decisions for you. So as not self, it says, I have to prove and I have to make myself better. I have to improve. I have to make myself a better person because I'm not good enough. I have to stay in control and have all this discipline and prove to myself that I can get better because nobody else has the resources for me. I have to work really hard and prove to myself that I have the capacity to work hard because nobody else has the affection for me or the resources. I mean, you know, I guess, I guess 37 is affection, 45 is more resources. But this whole tribal thing here, of not having enough scarcity, you know, there is no scarcity. If you're undefined ego, you can attract resources all the time. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. You know, you, as, a, as a projector, you can be recognized and you have all of these openings where guess what? Nature abhors a vacuum. <laughs> Defined ego people will be waiting to give you money and resources. Defined sacred will be waiting to work for you and, and give you their energy. <clears throat> it's all about being aligned to the right people. I've had projectors come to me and say, I want to start a new business. How do I start this business? You know, and um, yeah, it's really, you know, you need generators. You need generators to work for you. And if you have undefined ego, you need financers to finance it, you know, and so on. You just need these, these centers. Okay. Um, but you don't need to be these centers yourself. The solar plexus. I'm just highlighting this whole side of it right here, because really you see the solar plexus does have seven channels and it connects all the way over here, 41, 39, 19, all the way, you know, it really does connect a lot. It's this whole half of the chart. Really, I mean, except for the ego there. But um, yeah, so you look at the solar plexus and this is the second strongest for you. And this is gonna have gate 55 and gate 30 which are going to be these fixed points of nervousness that say, I can't let myself get too intimate. I can't let them, them get too close. I always love when I see the undefined spleen with the undefined solar plexus, keeping you at arm's length from the undefined solar plexus. Stay away, don't get too close. I'm running away from confrontation and truth. I don't want you to see the real me, but also don't go away. I'm not gonna let go of you, that undefined spleen. It's like keeping at arm's length, but not letting go. And that's how Ra puts it. And uh, you know, with this undefined solar plexus, really hiding who you are and the reasons why are in the 55 and the 30. The reasons why are because you can never be sure that 55 is eternally indecisive. Maybe I love him, maybe I don't, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. And then that 30 is that if you ever really give yourself fully, fate will take that person away. If you ever fall in love deeply, 
fate will take that person away. They'll get hit by a car, lightning will strike. That's the fear, right? That the fear of the fates, the fear of the fates. Meanwhile, there's this, if only I can be more intimate, what's wrong with me? I don't have more intimacy. And then with that 49, you know, what's wrong? I don't have more um, jealousy, even more possessiveness, more tribalness. And then meanwhile, there's this openness here between the 4037, the 2212, the 3635. All of that openness is a theme of denial, projection, and blame that says, what emotional problems? I'm not running away from truth. Other people run away from truth. I'm not running away from, you know what I mean? Like it's the one that's going to be completely invisible to you where you say, I'm not afraid of being lousy in bed. Other people have sexual hangups, you know? I'm not afraid of having no one to talk to or not having romance in my life. Other people are afraid of that. I'm not afraid of tradition that, that 3740, other people are. And then there's the fear of intimacy and then these, these other fears, the, you know, the fear of need in some sense, uh, the fear of loss of spirit, uh, and I guess the, the fear of losing someone to the fates. And so the only thing I can tell you about the undefined solar plexus is anytime you're feeling nervousness whatsoever, the slightest bit of nervousness, that means there's something that you need to tell someone and just go ahead and do it. Just do it. Don't worry about, am I initiating? Is it this? Is it that? You just, you know, someone says, hey, I'm really looking forward to the, the um, trip next week. And then you get a sinking feeling in your stomach because you're like, I don't want to go on this trip. Say, hey, look, sorry. I know you're really looking forward to it. I don't want to go on the trip. I'm not going to make it. Just say, you know, get used to saying I have bad news. It's as simple as that. Like, um, you know, I have bad news. I'm not going to be able to make it to the wedding. Just get used to saying, oh, I'm really sorry. I wanted you to be at the wedding. You know, you were going to be a big part of it. I know I just can't make it. You know, getting used to disappointing people. That's what the undefined solar plexus is so afraid of. Disappointing people. Because it's skewed because it, it's, it has a skewed view of them that they can't handle the disappointment. They can handle it. Don't worry about it. They can handle it. Let them be disappointed. Let them be disappointed. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the, the rest of, I would say the big three, it goes to the spleen. And then, so the eyes, those are the core of the not self. And beyond that, it, the, the others can be interesting, but you can do some of that analysis yourself or we can look at it because that's going to have more to do with how other people see you. I look at like the big three or the foundational three in some sense. So the spleen is going to be the last of those where really you have a lot of gates pointed at. You have 48 pointed at, 57 pointed at, 18 pointed at, 28 pointed at. These are all where you feel that you're lacking something. If only I had the depth, if only I was as deep as Jung, if only I could go so deep into that alchemical mystical stuff, then I would not be so bitter. I would have my success, but unfortunately I'm lacking something. I'm missing it. No, you're not. You know, that's just the illusion. It's the illusion that happens in the chart when it looks, it feels like you're missing something because you have a gate pointed at it and there's nothing there. Same with feeling like you're missing that 57. If only I were more intuitive, if only I had more um, depth of solutions. And so what does all this do? It becomes rationalizations. If only I had more purpose, if only you know things were better and more improved, they all become rationalizations. And the 5027, 32, 54 that are open become, you know, um, I have to be smart because I can't depend on anybody else, more independence, you know, and I have to do it myself because nobody will help me get ahead. And with that 44, ultimately, I have to uh, be really smart about where I invest and, you know, I have to be smart about being materially successful and I have to hold on to anything that brings me material success, even if it's unhealthy for me. I have to hold on to solutions, even if they're unhealthy for me, hold on to Things that bring me purpose, even if they're unhealthy for me. Hold on to things that make my life improved, even if they're unhealthy for me. And that's the thing is, you don't have to hold on to anything that's unhealthy for you. You don't. So, okay. So I'm just going to... Um, one second here. Okay. So I just wanted to do a little supplement on your nodes, because uh, that was the last thing in my notes. I, I know you'd asked about innocence. We covered the innocence. Um, you know, we can always go more in depth in it if you if you want to in a follow up. But and I think you had a few other questions uh, that I had written down in my notes that I'm pretty sure we covered. If there's anything I missed, let me know. But the nodes was something that you asked about specifically. Um, okay, so 
I'm just going to kind of read what Ra has to say about it. He has very interesting interpretations of the nodes. I mean, I know the gates, but he kind of interprets them in a different way. So I'm just going to read a little bit what he says here. The 3029, the 30th gate, the clinging fire in the emotional system. This is the gate of the fates. Freedom recognized as an illusion and limitation accepted as fate. So one of the things to understand about this as a stage that's being set for a process, if this is in the south node phase, one's going to have in one's background, the ability to be able to see and recognize the illusion of freedom and to see that that illusion, that that limitation accepted as something that is an act of transcendence. So uh, it's not in the south node for you, it's in the north node, right? So this is what you're growing towards. Uh, this is the, the first one, one I should say. Because uh, this is, or this is on the personality side. So maybe the one that's going to be more, more obvious, we could say. Then we'll read the design side, which is the 5559. Okay, so literally in terms of the background environment, one is going to see all kinds of forces in one's life hit a brick wall. Whether it's your family hitting a brick wall materially, or it's a health issue, whatever the case may be. In the background of your movie with that 30th gate being there, the hand of the fates are going to be in the environment. Yeah, the fates are at work through gate 30. It's really interesting to watch. It also means because this is the environment that's gonna surround you because of the characters in the environment are gonna be dealing with the consequences of it, the way you fulfill your purpose is going to be through the acceptance of this. So you just recognize that freedom is an illusion and that limitation is something that can only be surrendered to. The 29th gate, the abysmal. On the other side, you have the 29th gate, and this is the abysmal, the deep within the deep. This is all about saying yes and making commitments and persistence. So, okay, so now he distinguishes between the south node and the 29th and the 30th gate. Now you have south node in the 29th, you have 30th uh, in the north, right? In the north node. So south node and the 29th, this is you. When you're looking at this movement as scenery in the background of somebody's life, obviously the 29 to 30 is very different from 30 to 29. The thing to recognize clearly is that if you're beginning with the 29, and that's where you are, then one of the things to see is that the first period, the rewards are not there in that phase. The first half of life, the persistence is going to be the teaching instrument of the environment around you. It's only through that persistence that you can get the reward of the recognition on the other side. And that's in the hand of the fates, the hands of the fates. So regardless of how persistent you are going to be, the rewards are always going to be limited in the hands of the fates. So, okay, so this is really just saying that, you know, just to put it all in context, your correct environment is really a signpost for you. It's a signpost for you, meaning you just get to see it all around you. It's not that you have to be it even as much as you just see it, although you do embody characteristics of the environment, of course. You embody characteristics of this gate 30, you can be an instrument of the fates and so on, and you embody characteristics of the 59 and the 55 and so on. So now on the design side, we have the 5955. And this 5955, I'll just read what Ra has to say here. The South Node, oh, sorry. So let's see which ones. For, so for you, it's actually the North Node in the 55. So let me, let me switch over. I've included both in the notes, but um, South Node in the 59. If you begin with the 59, you go through the background of everything about finding the other, because 59 is about breaking through the barrier to get to the other. But the fact of the matter is that as you move into the second half of your life, this is, you know, after your midlife, after your 40s, uh, so this is not for a while to come yet, there is this deep emotional uncertainty about the quality of the bonds that one has, and whether the bonds were really worthwhile, because that's the framework that's there in the background. 55, emotional uncertainty, right? I was, I was talking about how that 55 can never be sure about love. So it's like the 59 breaks through to the 55. The environment right now is the environment you're in is how do we get through to relationship? How do we make real intimacy? How do we find real intimacy? How do we break through and have a real connection? And then later in life, it goes to the, the uncertainty of what is the, that connection all about? The ability to break down barriers to achieve union, sure, but the 55th gate is under mutation. So it's polarity. The 59 is also under mutation. Our sexual roles are under mutative pressure as well. Yeah, so having that south node in the 59 um, is really about breaking down the bonds and, and then finding out whether the bonds were really worthwhile or not in the second half of life. Okay, I think that will cover it for today. Um, just remember, you know, it's really about noticing those not-self themes, noticing when the not-self 
flares up, noticing when you blame yourself or have low self-esteem or any sort of, if only I were better, forget about it. That's part of the deconditioning. But then there's other parts too, like the open channels where you see, you know, where you think that nobody else is out there to help you. It's not true. There are other people out there that will help you. People will recognize you and do recognize you and they will see you. And what they'll recognize is that you're awake. They'll look out in the room and they'll see all these people who are asleep and they'll see you who was really awake with that 10, 20, and they'll recognize your awakeness and those will be the right people for you. Thanks so much for, for doing all this. It's been a, it's been a real joy doing the reading. Thanks for, I guess I should say, thanks for, um, for hiring me. Thanks for watching. And I look forward to following up in whichever capacity you, you like. If you'd like to do email follow-up, that's totally fine. And um, I'm also available for telephone and, and Zoom follow-up. Thanks so much.